as a player, I think there is a lot of attractions going abroad. I mean, you've got to be quite merciful about it. So I've got no judgment with the players in the current market. People talk every week about the need for superstars. If those superstars aren't playing in the Premiership, you've got a problem. We're not looking at a mass exodus. If, if you look at the biggest global game, the biggest money turner in the world, and they are happy to do it, why? Football. Yeah, football. Why can't rugby do it? Three, two, one. Hello, Dream Team. Welcome along to this week's episode. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jeez. Dream Team. Welcome along to this week's episode of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby, brought to you by our very good friends at Continental Tyres. I hope you're well. I hope you had a good week. Before we start, though, with Englishmen abroad, yes or no, how was your weekend? We did a lock-in on the, the big event for the World Cup winners of 2003 at the Hammersmith. Yeah. Was it pa Apollo? Yes, it was yeah. Hammersmith. Apollo. How yeah. was your dinner on Saturday? I saw a couple of very nice photos of all of you looking... Really quite surprisingly smart uh, and upright. Yes, it was lovely. Um, first time I've seen Bolsh and Kate in a long time. So it led to a lot, not much sleep. Right. And a, a lot of The photo you put in the group was of the booze. three or four of you in, in very fluffy dressing gowns having your nails done while drinking champagne. Yeah. progressed from there. So that was Saturday. That's the first bottle might have got popped around 10.15. Right. And I went to bed at 4 a.m. Good effort. And we what, didn't... feeling unwell or something? Because you normally go all the way through. We didn't leave the bar. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we stayed in the, uh, in our dressing room until about one fifteen, and then went to the Forester's pub, which is just out and turned left out, Penny Hill. Yes. Stayed there till 5.30, and then 6.30, 6 6.30. Yeah. Uh, reception. Speeches? Were there uh, memories? Uh, Bit of a yeah, sing-song? So or was it just... Uh, Clive said Island. a few words. Anyone um, listen or...? Yeah, Jono said a few words, and then some, for some reason, because we gave everyone a bottle of Black Eye, Oh yeah, I had to say a bit about Black Eye. But did you? And then she said, but well, you might as well, whilst you're up there, say something about the groups. So right. I did. Yeah. Don't know how it went down, but it was all right. About the what? About the group? About, about us as a group. Oh, as you, a group. you pissed up, thought it was a good idea to make a speech. Nails yeah. up good, though. But yeah. Honest Mike didn't come out. Really? It yeah, almost did, because it wasn't oh, Red One. It almost did. Yeah. with all of you lot is. <laughs> I, used, uh, I, I actually tried to bring it all back together because everyone's got different experiences of that World Cup campaign and where they sat within the team and everything else. So I used the great line from the uh, that the Queen used, that recollections may differ. Yeah, uh, Everyone's got their own view of how that was, where it was. Some are unbelievably good. You know, Lowell played every game. I played the, all the big games and just missed Uruguay. So I have a great... Well, obviously I got dropped, but you have an experience of where you sat within it. And some of them, let's be honest, aren't always giving me great memories. You yeah. thought you might have done more, you thought you should have played yeah. or whatever. So what I was trying to do is then bring it back to the fact that, it, you know, those memories you need to let go now because you, you were still part of something that made it great. Yeah. And you everyone was a part of that and played a vital role because if you weren't gutted about not being in the team you might not have pushed the guy who was in front of you harder you know what I mean yeah uh, imagine, imagine uh, that's what it, you think he said yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 having had I his first off champagne why, at 10am yeah. I didn't want to understand why Clive had a cut on his forehead like after talking, throwing like, a plate at him he's like talking to the curtain yeah. fuck yeah. probably all you lot is you know memories <laughs> you remember uh, remember <laughs> Appar <laughs> apparently there were no snake, steak knives left but no, right. I don't understand come on tour if you want to was there any moment that you looked around the room and went wow you've done well off it and go, well, you know, that someone's absolutely killed it or go, God, I remember what a dickhead you were and I'm glad I haven't seen you in the last 20 years. <laughs> no, no. We Nostalgia did has a warm glow on, yeah, a, on yeah. a one-off basis, I think, I think, it? I think so, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm not going to say that Bolsch might have tried to have that conversation when we were in the pub. Like, who do you not want to sit That's next what I mean. Of course, that's, yeah. <laughs> of course, Bolsch did, but uh, we uh, we didn't entertain it. Yeah, shut him um, down. Yeah, and... Uh, I, no, it was great. I, I spoke to everyone. Got everyone got around the room and actually had a proper catch up, which was nice. I was talking to Julian about his six hundred sheep and him Julian just White. wrestling away. Yeah, Julian White. Yeah. The photo I saw, I thought it was really nice to see people like Dave Reddin and Steve Lander. And he was on great form, Otis. But, but yeah. guys who were sort of obviously a part of the journey, but yeah. weren't necessarily on the front and centre of the podium. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, they. Was Cheryl so the were there as well? Yeah, Cheryl was there. Yeah. Every everyone was there. The the guy, the Australian. Uh, t not team manager, but you know the liaison. Guy, the liaison who he came over for really? it. Really? So it was just it was uh, John. He was it was great to s that Clive invited pretty much everyone that had touched that team in that period. Yeah. Um, but you know the coaches do it every year. They like to pat themselves on the back every year. This is the first time in eighteen years they've invited us, so yeah. it was quite nice. Of them I just wondered if you walked <laughs> in and like someone turned up. Because obviously when you've got a group of very successful people, you're, you're united by a level of success that most people can't attain. Whether someone turns up in a Ferrari just to show that they've done well, another one's turning in like tracksuit, you see like 
you know, Julian White's taking all the buffet and putting it in his pockets to go home. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like people robbing stuff. Yeah, Julian's neck is ginormous. Really? Uh, yeah, Ronnie reached out. Here, Bab. What's wrong with you, man? I don't. I like him. I like him. What? I said, Ron, Ronnie, I'll, I'll, t I'll speak to him. I'll speak, I'll speak to him. To, he, he wants right. to reach out. He yeah. wants to. Does he, wants to, he, he wants to build, build, build he wants bridges. Build bridges. He? he goes, I, I like him. I like him. Push him off it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I love Ronnie. I, I just, I don't think it's. There's no beef, my end. I just think they're funny stories, but, but recollections may vary. I think, <laughs> I think he said them. And I, they I think happened. he I think, thinks they didn't. I think he's getting bored that, but everyone uses his stories that aren't necessarily true and are being quite well embellished. And yeah. I think he sort of gets annoyed by yeah, it. Yeah, well, it's not personal. I love you, Ronnie. You're, you know, you're welcome. When I got the utmost respect for you, we had we had a lot of laughs on um, in circle. Was it 2000? Yeah. Drift. Drift. That was literally drift. the first thing he said. He drew a line down the pitch. He goes, drift this side. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, Jono's speech. Because in 2003, obviously, it was just a look. The story goes, it was just a look. Oh, was yeah, it, it just a look, or with us some, some no, it was, emotional it was words. Short. I think it. I think it was short. I think, you know. It's more just thinking of everyone who's been there. You know, yeah. you, f you forget how many people were involved, how ma you know, how many coaches were, you know, Phil Keithroach, you know, God bless him, I love that guy. Still always just wants to sit with the What did you do row. with Phil Keithroach, who was the scrum coach? No, I just love him. Yeah. Because you know, he always just used to say, the props could solve every problem. Right, right. Yeah, you know what I mean? He was just that. Yeah. He got rid of them, they'd fix a few problems. <laughs> so he, Hygiene, you know, he scrummaging. He always wants to be have a have a props lunch and everything else. And, yeah. Um so no, it's it's just great to see everyone all the people that you sort of either take for granted or you don't necessarily think about all the time. Well done. Great days they were, and it's great to see the sort of the reunion and obviously the, the nostalgia that goes with it. And from the heights obviously of two thousand and three to probably one of the hottest topics in English rugby right now, which has had a bumpy old few years, as we've discussed a number of times. But there are a lot of headlines within English rugby at the moment surrounding the contract situation, particularly of the highest profile players. So there was an article last week surrounding Mara Toje, who potentially is going to be looking at a 50% pay cut if he wants to stay at Saracens. Why are you smirking? <laughs> no one's taking a 50% pay cut. No. So you, th there are loads of caveats. Well, I took a 50% to this. Cent, I, I took one to go to Northampton, but that, that's the yours point. That's when you're really yours was more than 50%. It was more than 50%. When that's when you're really dedicated and focused and really committed. Yeah. But not when you're that young. I had to, I had to take a 50% pay cut whilst still being England captain and <laughs> getting back to Gloucester after. Yeah. Why was that? New Zealand. Because the Gloucester board wanted to get rid of me. Right. Because Why of, was that? Because of... 2011. Oh, really? Yeah, I was captain of the club and I was captain of England at that point. Well, right. I lost the captaincy because of that boat trip, didn't I? That's it. And they all say it wasn't. They all said it was just they wanted me to focus on other things. Right. So shit. I had no club when I played for the Barbarians in 2012. Yeah. And I had to play three games in a week to get a contract off Nigel. And Nigel Davis. Played well, yeah. And I was, I was uncontracted during the 2011. Well, I was the first century contracted player that's ever been. Do you want to explain that before we get into this? Because this <laughs> yeah, is quite interesting. Yeah. What we're going to end up with here is a fairly unscientific bouncing around. Full of, of rhetoric, bullshit, of, hyperbole. Of should England players now be allowed to ply their trade overseas and still play for England? Yes. Is the question we're going to ask. I'm not sure we're going to get to a yes or no. Is there a kind of a, a potential solution? Is this? Lots of people obviously talking about it, but it'd be very interesting to get... Your perspective, having played in France, Japan, New Zealand, yeah. and your perspective, obviously, having not, but having, as, as you're saying, been through some of these contract situations before. Just talk us through this yeah. so, contract situation that you ended up with. Was it 2011? Or yeah, something? so 2011, um, I finished my contract with Stanford. Say they didn't renew my my contract because that the, the um, uh, um, Max Cuisine unfortunately sold um, the business to essentially via Bernard Port, and uh, it's all alleged and everything else. To basically, you know, those, that, that person who calls up can have your sort code and account number, please. Yeah. And basically, yeah, like big Nigerian dollars yeah, in a, got, a bank account yeah, waiting yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, I've got 25 million Nigerian arms. dollars. I want to sell them to you. This is basically what the conversation said. And they sold them to a load of businessmen. And it turned out they didn't have a pot to piss and sold them. And the whole thing collapsed. And then a guy who owns a SIM card, um, sort of millionaire SIM card business, came and took it. And that's when. Um, uh, Ollie Phillips' mate, I can't remember, never remember his name. Richard Paul, uh, Richard yes, Paul, Paul Jones, Jones took over, and that's how the club survived. Because Max, Max basically built this club up, sold it to a load of disreputable businessmen. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Um, and then basically it, it all fell apart. So there wasn't any contracts anyway. Um, right. And I was obviously left without a club or any pay to, to train for the World Cup. So it was a very unique situation because I wanted to sign with... Um, by the time it came to the World Cup, I was, I was playing for... Um, the Black Rams. Um, oh no, yeah. Or yeah, something. but you had to fill the time between. I had between to fill the time. Then, yeah, I had to fill the time because I couldn't. I couldn't what was do the period? It. Six months? Yeah. Five months? Uh, no, no. It was only a couple of months. It was a okay. couple of months, um, and they basically 
offered me and the RFU paid me as a contracted, centre contracted player. So I would train and I would be paid by the RFU. And did you have to keep Sturm? Yes, I did so, keep Sturm. So yeah, but d were you told we'll do this? But yes, keep yes, yeah. yes. This was not to be talked about with anyone. This is between us. We're not going to speak about it. Yeah. Um, just get on with it. This is to fill a gap because we want you to play in the World Cup. So I said absolutely fine. I did that uh, accordingly. Um, I went from uh, uh, Stade Français to centrally contracted to uh, the Rico Black Rams to then the Highlanders. Yeah. And that's how it, and when then I came back to, came back to us at the end of it. And there are other examples of players who I think apparently have done that. So yes. Ben Tier apparently yeah, ben was another one. Yeah, Badges, lastly, possibly, yeah. I don't yeah. know. There have obviously been ways of fixing playing contract challenges in the past. There is obviously a new professional game agreement that's going to be coming out and we're hearing about hybrid contracts that are going to be a big part of that, which means that England players will be sort of guaranteed match fees in advance type thing, or they the RFU will pay a portion of their salary, um, which will hopefully mitigate against the appeal of going overseas. But as it stands right now, the Premiership has got enormous financial problems. That's not m news to anybody right here, right now. We have had three clubs that have gone bust, and that has seen players going overseas. Jack Willis, Jack Noel, obviously, from, from Exeter. Henry Arundel is at uh, Racing 92 right now. Obviously, Jack hasn't gone because of financial problems. But we've got this kind of middle ground at the moment when no one's quite sure whether the premiership is going to be able to hold up and and look after the players that have got premium value or whether the overseas money is going to sort of win out where do you sit at the moment on top tier english talent the requirement for them to play in england because that's what holds the league up it's what gives steve borthwick the time he wants against the commercial opportunities which are greater overseas right now? I'm not sure it's a yes-no answer, but what does your gut uh, say? Well, I, f I feel it is a yes-no answer at this moment in time. I think if you go back to when it was 7.9 million was the salary cap and there was enough money to go around and pay your players what they're worth, then I would say there isn't a reason to go over there. But at the moment, now that's come, well, it's, it's at 5 million or 4.9 or whatever it is at the moment, then, and you put that, you split that, how it's come down, sort of 1.92 million. You know, that's 60, math, quick math, 55, 60 grand a player over a 35 month squad, yep. which is quite a bit of cash per year in a, in a game that's pretty brutal anyway, in the fact that any day could be your last day. Yep. You've only got a 10 year window to, to do it. Um, I think with, I think it's very hard if you can go and earn that money to not let people go when they can't earn that money in the in what in the current offering that you're giving them and you then have to put into the fact that you know you look at anthony watson and players sp sp certain positions are undesirable because there's a shed load of players who can fill them so the best in the world at that position can't is generally is not seen as a value add because my value adds are my key my key positions my tight head prop my hooker my my nine my ten uh, probably a specialised fullback. Even the, even they're not necessarily key. You you need one superstar second row, and you need definitely need one, maybe two superstar back row. You need eight, probably taking priority. So they they are the positions that are going to take majority of the cash, and then the others fill in the fill in the blanks. And it's who you know, which is unfortunately the way it's become shouldn't yeah. be. Uh, so you then have to go find where you can go and get paid what you need to make to live but also invest for the future whether you, you know, whatever you do pensions or look for other things uh so you've got to be quite mercenary about it so i've got no judgment with the players in the current market now if it was back to where we're 7.9 it's obviously supposed to go up to 6.4 next year but speaking to any club owner if you said do you want that to go back up they'll go no because the game is not financially in a place where they can suddenly just add another 1.4 million onto it. But it, it does start to go up next season. Yeah, I know it does. But, but people no don't want one, it to go what up. What I'm saying right. is no one wants it to go up. So right. it. And you're going to get then CEOs and, and clubs, not gonna, they're not going to spend up to the cash, uh, up to the cap, because they know they, they can't make that money back. So that's not where we want to be either. You know, and I think what uh, Jerry was trying to say, is that you've got to live by your means. Yeah. And if that, this and was in his article in the And people paper. have sort yeah. of got to switch on to that. It's not... You know, I know Ellis has said about it before that you want billionaire owners coming in or whatever. That's fine, but you still fundamentally have to be able to make money, which then makes the club more valuable. You've got to do a shitload more work off the pitch making brands, clubs that are brands. That's what football is. That's all football is sold. Yep. You know, that you, they have a billionaire owner coming in because they know they can grow the asset. But 
if you look at the facts of how many spots are out there for players to go and fill overseas, yeah. we're not looking at a mass exodus. Because every 180 spots, basically, it, yeah. yeah, that you can have in top 14 are, are available for um, um, international there's players. There's less yeah, so in just Japan, 14 yeah. in Japan. Confirm whatever. that. In the top 14, you're allowed, th as a squad, you're allowed 13 non-GIF spots per squad. So non-French players, you're allowed 13 per, per squad in France. And in Japan, it's three capped players within a squad and seven uncapped players within a squad, so 10 in total. Yeah, that's how James so, Grayson yeah. would get and over they're yeah. exactly. And they're taking those seven so that they can play you for Japan. I just... Yeah. I, it's, it's so, one of, so, but this is the problem. Is, it, is You ask the question, should England players be allowed to play overseas, yes or no? And you, once you yes, start picking, yes, the whole should, thing yes, kind of I, falls I can apart. Answer, yes, so, you should do, because I, I think... This has got a tiered approach, right? So, I, I mean, I saw a quote here from, from, from Brian. I think it's Brian Moore. He says, those who advocate no restrictions must say how they mean to deal with the potentially disastrous uh, consequence of a mass exodus for elite players. The point is, like, you've got to understand, when you're in it and you're playing sport, when I went abroad, I was probably one of the first people to go... I was to go to play top 14 with, with you know, like, um, Johnny Wilkins obviously went at the same time. I went to Stavron State. I went there because... Why was Johnny allowed to go? Because he was Johnny Wilkinson. Was he? I mean, is that is that, yeah, that the answer was, to he, the was, question? he was basically they created that rule and they made it for him. So but, he could but go you and do were it. Like, you were both allowed to go and still well, play. I for went England. before him and I was allowed to do it because um, there wasn't a rule in place, right? And it wasn't. So an the issue. rule came in off the back of it. Yeah, it came off the back of it when when I started to go and it and I didn't miss one England game. I played I played forty games a season for Stad in t for two years in a row uh, and that included the England games and I never and I never missed a game and I was able to travel backwards and forwards. There was that one incident where Max, the owner, kept the money because he wanted me back and, and Martin Johnson didn't play me but kept me over there and he just took um, half my salary out my my wage packet and then just said sue me. And then right. by the time I looked in the French law, I was never going to get the money back. My, my, the point is, I think, you look at the, 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 the game, this, ha this is going to have to happen because of the, the evolution <laughs> of the game. You know, as a young player or as a player, I went to France to challenge myself. There is, there is the top 14 league, I think, is, is, is the games are much more traditional. It's bigger, it's better, and people really enjoy it. The Premiership has its place. I think it is, it is fantastic. It's very, very competitive. Um, you know, there are some big moments. There obviously isn't the audiences watching it. It isn't making any money. Fr French rugby, I don't know if it makes money, but there's certainly the capital to back it. As a player, I, I think there is a lot of attraction to going abroad. You know, I, d I didn't go for the money. I know people said that. But when I had my, my, my time at WASP was always very jaded because every contract offer was a pay cut because we used to win things, then we stopped winning things and they still, they kept trading off. If you if you want to play with us, you will win things. And you look around, they're like, no, you, no, we're not. You're not recruiting anyone. You're underpaying everyone. This is never going to happen. I saw the writing was on the wall and lo and behold, after that period of time, they didn't win anything. So yeah. I was kind of vindicated in that respect. But I went there because I looked at the Stade Francais team, Sergio Parise, Juan Hernandez, um, Julien Dupuy, Pierre Rabadan, Pascal Pape, um, you know, uh, you know uh, Gonzo Ts, Gonzalo yeah. Ts, loads of players in there, were all over the, the shop. And I was like, wow, I can really test myself against some of the best players. Sergio Parise being one, you know, let me see what it's about. Then to get paid what my market rate was. And I think, you know, Jeremy Gus is right. You can only pay what you can pay. But when you look at France, go, this is what these players are earning. Yeah. Why would I want to sit in the UK in a league that isn't growing, in, in, in a games that are being underwatched and not get paid my value? And, and especially when you're not, no, no disrespect, yeah. but <laughs> there you go. Before, no, I, just before I abuse you, yeah, here comes yeah. the hammer. Yeah. Uh, you weren't guaranteed to be starting no. every England game. No, no, no. So they're saying you're not guaranteed your 23 bags yeah. or whatever it was a game. So you're then taking potentially a it on the possibility yeah. that they might pick you. So yeah, and, and I think, and I, again, I, you know, I ended up. I, mean, I said not missing an England game, started those games in that period of time because it made me a better player yeah. playing in those tougher, more attritional leagues, attritional games that we love. So the big Heineken Cup weekends here were what we all wanted to play in. I was doing that every single week within the madness of the, of the French League and all the emotion that went with it and going to every different region and finding these incredible diehard fans that you have a little bit in the country, but you don't. The problem where, you, where everyone's disagreeing is, is they're looking at the, the older school mentality, which is going to protect the game at all costs. It's going to reset. It's going to reset. It has to rebalance because there isn't the money and there isn't the financial ability to pay for it. So I think it's 100% a yes. And I think that you've got 180 spots that you've got to deal with Australians, Kiwis, um, South Africans, all going over there at the same spot. And I think you will lose some players, yeah. but other players will, will fill the, fulfill the void. Yeah, so and, and for years, the Premiership has been every other nation's playground to let all their decent players get paid, good wedge, and whilst they upskill their next generation... Whereas we we haven't had that, so everyone uses our league. So why don't we just embrace letting 
other leagues pay. I mean, as you say, it's not going to be that many people. No. Get, it might be yeah. five or six England players that leave, seven or eight. Yeah, but it will reset the. Ba- but, I think it, it has to reset the yeah. balance, like you know, because the moment it's it's it's, it's unbalanced. France has a lot more money. That the salary caps are, are insane. We're losing players because we can't physically afford them. And I think that what's going to have to happen is you have to cull. And players have to go and have to be allowed to play. And I think we will be better over here and it will raise the competitive standard, I think, because other players will fill the void and you'll be com- competing much more for England because yeah. you will have lost players abroad. And actually going to France is not a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you well, know, that's, why, that's why you take the money. You know you're going to get used and you're going to have to, you've got to make that decision. Do you want to, are you going to be able to manage your playing? Because you're going to get played every opportunity that they can yeah. play you because if they're paying you a good market rate, you're going to have to play. Yeah. So you've then got to get your head around the fact that you're going to be playing every week. And if you go to Japan, Japan, they had a six, they have a six month preseason. Like, so I was, I, I thank my lucky stars that I basically was in, in Japan. Uh, I missed the, the, the pre-season. I turned up two weeks before the start of the season. Did the whole season where there's 65 people training every day on that training field and because because they believe in the mentality all for one and one for all and they won't separate. They won't let anyone not train. So like when you do it, I was number eight. I had to go through six sets of front row in a scrummaging session that took two hours because they wouldn't tell the other ones because they've got no word for no. There's no chance you're ever playing. Sod off. And I went to the coach and said to him, listen, we can't, we can't, I can't keep doing this. Okay, okay, I'll listen to you. Next day, nothing, next day, nothing. And then someone took me to one side and said, listen, you've got to stop asking that. They're not going to change it. It's all for one and one for all. We're all part of the same team. I went, but they're never going to play. doesn't matter. That's the tradition. So you're, you're, all these places are not quite as a picnic. You have six months pre-season. Then you have a, then you have a season. And they are, you know, they're pride, they pride themselves on being incredible tacklers over there. I watched Mar Nono in his second training session. This young hooker from the other team flew into the bottom of his knee at, knee, at like, like, you know, low level flight, because that's the way they talk to tackle over there. And, the, and because a lot of it's kind of down to um, pre- pretense, if, you, if you're seen to be like being incredibly brave, they love that. Like I watch people do fitness tests, run, miss the line, no one say anything, then they fall and collapse and they get stretched off. And everyone's like, yeah. And then they come back and they stand by it. And everyone's like, good effort. You're like, we fucking missed the line eight times. What are you talking about? Should've... But you don't say any of that. There's so much th- theater and, and social standing and honor about everything that they do. Manonu honestly got hit. I thought, I, I, I puked in my mouth. I was like, oh my God, his <laughs> knee's literally going to come off. And obviously, Mar leapt up and was like, going to kill the guy because it was a Tuesday afternoon training session. The bloke almost ended his career. It's not quite as simple as you think over there. And it's not just going for the money. So, all these things come with uh, a, a, you know, a, a reason you get paid that money. And I think it will level stuff out in, in the UK because you'll lose some players, but then you'll rebalance what's going on over here. And what we don't want, you know, the RFU have talked about this uh, sort of being a, a semi-centrally contracted type thing for the 20, where it's 200 grand or whatever. But then for does the, that mean... Oh, for the top, the, the top 20 players. Yeah, sorry, but yeah. then does that mean they are guaranteed to be picked, if, even if they're out of form? Does that then lead a different way? Plus, you're not getting your match fee. They're only going to pay you that... You're, you're basically getting your match fee spread over a year rather than playing it. It was like, well, that, that's, that doesn't really help the deficits of where you're going. You want the money and then you play for England off the back of it or whatever. Can we can we break this down? Because I'm conscious we it's, it's so interlinked. Yes. I just want to break it into four subjects, yeah. essentially. One, why do players want to go abroad? And, and I'm going to ask you about that yeah. because it's not just about the money. Yeah. I want to ask about the benefit of playing in top 14. Yeah. The, the pros of going abroad for, for England players yeah. and for the league, the negatives of yeah. going abroad, and then what would it look? What would the ideal scenario look like going forward? So the really interesting thing is every article you read at the moment, it's all financial based. Yes. It's all about Mara going to France because he's been asked to take hypothetically a 50% yeah. pay cut. And I'm sure there's agent jostling going in on this. But you, you said a very interesting thing, which is it wasn't just about the cash. And actually, we, we've spoken to Jack Noel recently since he's been at La Rochelle. He said, I wish I'd gone years ago. He says, absolute yeah. paradise. He yeah. said he's Ill, living in Ile de Ray. It's a packed stadium every week. He's playing in the sunshine. He's playing with some of the best players in the world. He is absolutely loving his rugby right now. If you're looking at someone, so say you take the top 10 players, how much would a Maro want to go and play for a Racing or a Toulon because of the opportunity that it affords him as well as what it puts Look, into I his bank? I think, well, so, so firstly, um, it, is, it always has to be much more than financial reward because you see so many of these players, and this fits in the negative section afterwards, especially some of the Welsh guys and Irish guys, go over to France, find out it is not as close and as friendly and as, and as they, they're used to that kind of calming environment. Johnny Sexton would be an example. Well, half the Welsh guys who went off there, you know, yeah. always came back after, back after a season because, you know, the mum wasn't just down the road, the friends weren't down the road, there's a lot of travelling, training's long, 
you know, it can be a bit theatrical over there. It can be a bit mad. You've lost all your friends and family. Um, you're going there on your own. Yes, you're paid money, but suddenly you realize there isn't enough money in the world to fill that void of happiness. You know, I, I had three coaches in my first year of Stade Francais, and it must have been a two-month period where I stood in my bathroom at my home looking at myself going, what the fuck am I doing here? Right. Why have I done this? I don't need this abuse. Like, I, I, it's when I had to, Ben Kayser tell the story, it's when I threatened to knock out the coach because he, he, he was so rude and so insulting, so patronizing, so awful to me that I was like, it doesn't matter how much money I, I'm getting. It's, I don't want to be here. Um, luckily, he got fired, so it was all okay. <laughs> um, but I... It, 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 I think people, you think about the money first because that's the attractive thing, but then you've got to think about, uh, will it make me a better player? Will I win stuff? Because getting paid a fortune and losing is not fun. Um, will I be close to my friends and family? Am I versatile enough? Am I uh, self-reliant enough to be able to look after myself and make the most of it? You know, when I went to Japan, you the, suddenly you realise that no one's watching you. No one's uh, looking over your shoulder. I was living in a tiny little house next to the training ground, getting to work on a bicycle. I had no friends around me, couldn't, couldn't speak the language, didn't know what I was doing, but I had some great foreign guys with me. And I had suddenly realized, actually, I was self-motivated. I was driven, because I knew I had to go into uh, Super 15, and that I was raising my standards. So I'd do extra training, all that kind of stuff. So that is a big factor. It's not just about money, it's about all those things. And I think people get lulled by the money, but then, or lulled by the money, but then they have to think much more about the whole process. Is it too simplistic to say, if you are an England player heading overseas, you go to Japan for the cash, you go to Super Rugby for the Experience, chance to get yeah, better, yeah. and then you go to France for both? Yes, I, I, I think, y yes, basically, in, in a nutshell, I think the, the Super 15 challenge, which people have experienced, it's such a distilled and very different game over there. Where did you, where did you get better, France um, or New I Zealand? Got, I, I, well, do you know what? I, well, the Japan, I got better because I learned that actually I really cared what people thought about my game. I was interested in being super successful and I raised my standards and I had to train myself and had to really manage myself medically wise, training wise, nutrition wise, diet wise, everything. So I, I, I learned to be much more of a man. Professional. Yeah. And professional. Uh, France, I became, I tested myself against some of the best guys and I found out that actually I could compete. I loved the experience, the emotion, the journey, and I grew up as a, grew up as a person. And I got better as a player. Again, I saw the way that I set my own standards and was competitive and I found out it was a confidence boost. New Zealand was purely there for rugby. Again, discipline, learning about the game, looking behind the curtain and seeing actually which country, because wherever you play South Africa, it's a horrific physical battle. Yeah, not just at club rugby, but at international rugby. That was the way they were. Australians, you know, uh, well drilled, but quite um, at the time structure based. You know, sort of middle middle ground guys, fantastic athletes, but not as good as Kiwis who just lived and breathed rugby. All they cared about over there was if you played for the All Blacks and you had a ball in your hand and all the stuff that went with it and that freedom to play and that confidence and that expression and the fast paced nature of it and what athletes they were. And I got better there again. And I came into that wasp season because I rolled straight off a plane into um, playing for WASP, which is probably why my body fell apart like a year and a half later. But all of them were experiences. But I say France and New Zealand, I definitely got better than, I, than I've ever been. But every single one of it saved, uh, served a purpose. And at every single one of those locations, money stopped being relevant because it all came down to, you're so far away from your friends and family. Uh, what makes you tick? Do you actually care? Why are you doing this? And are you prepared to learn? And do you have to throw yourself into the culture? And I threw myself into everything, but even I regret my time at France, my, my, my flatmate, Ollie Phillips, he learned French within, in no time at all, was off interacting with everyone. I kept going back to the UK for physio, for treatment, for um, international duty, and I didn't immerse myself in the culture enough, and I didn't come away speaking fluent French, which was a complete waste. So again, I have regrets over those things. I think if you're open-minded and throw yourself in, that's fine, but if you're isolated, and if you think your life in England is gonna be the same, so if you think Mario is gonna be treated the same as he's treated at Saracens, and he goes to one of these clubs, he's gonna get the shock of his life, because that's not how it works. Right. And, and I think maybe someone like, if you're leather levels of Sia Khaleesi, maybe Mario's up there, then you're afforded, you know, people, you have kind of your, you see them dancing by the side of the field, security, you're looked after, you're a real commodity. For someone like me, I was... <laughs> Meat. <laughs> Meat. But, 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 yeah, I had to prove myself. Do you regret not going abroad? Did you have a chance to? Um, or was it always just West Country through and through? No, no, I looked at it in, actually, before we went to the World Cup in 2011 at Toulon. Did you? And did you do the pit? Did you remember Dricko used to get on contract negotiations oh, and come yeah, around no, and he'd go and do a little pitch walk in Biritz? And suddenly he'd get the contract yeah. from Leinster he was looking for. Yeah, little no. PJ in and out in the day. I didn't did do, you do that. Anything like that. No. Uh, and the reason why I didn't go for it, I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to go halfway through a season where I didn't know anyone. Oh, really? um, I would prefer, I wanted to do it if I was going to do it, where you go and you do all the hard yards and the 
pre-season first. But interesting, you as a player, like I remember speaking to Dawes, no, I didn't, I knew you, but didn't know you that well. At Gloucester, there was like a, a tight community. You had your mates there. You were king of the castle around there. You lived around that area. Yeah. You had mates, and, it, and you like you found comfort in that. Yeah. So, well, the whole journey was that you know from Bath to Gloucester, I didn't want to leave Bath, and uh, I left Bath basically because I fell out with. Andrew Brownsword and the fact that I told them six months in advance what I wanted before my contract ran out and I said it's non-negotiable it's not going up it's not going down I know I can get more if I leave but if we lock it in now six months ahead I'll sign it now and I'll stay and this is where I'll stay for a whole career and they just ignored me ignored me and pushed it back pushed me back and then you know it was 150 grand I asked for and I'd stay yeah I knew that Obviously, you're not supposed to speak to anyone before Christmas, but everyone always does go. And, like, Sarries were happy to take me on whatever I wanted. So was Sale. Uh, and then, obviously, Gloucester were interested. And I was like, look, I don't want to leave, but I want, you know, uh, you've been paying me apps in compared to where the level I was How paying. How big a pay and rise percentage-wise was it that you were asking well, for? Well, I, I was on 80 grand, and I'd won the World Cup, and I'd, I'd been Players' Player of the Year for the last two seasons, Fans' Player of the Year for the last two seasons. So it, it, I was like, I'm not, you know. You weren't even asking for full market value, but no. just a, a big bump. No. So, yeah. So it was like, just pay and I'll stay. And then we, anyway, we, we went back around. Jack Rowell was just messing me around and everything like that. And and then it got it gets to January the 1st. And Gloucester, I went up and watched Gloucester and watched like Sinbad and Django and all these boys training. I was like, this f different gravy. Because also at that point, Bath had got rid of... You know, there was that one year they just got rid of so many international players and Ollie Barkley and, and all the trust sort of went into all these young kids. And then we started finishing 10. You, you were a fan. We yeah. ended up start finishing 9th yeah, <laughs> and 10th. You know, and it was a long way from where, we, where we'd been in the very early f first years of, you know, 2000 with Catty and Jerry and all these guys. Um, and I was like, well, actually, it looks like they play better rugby. You know, we won that. We won the... We won the basically Parker Penn Shield the first year that I went there, and I was like, "Well, actually, we've won something which I've never done with Bath." Yeah. Um, so, sort of vindication for, you know, uplifting pay, but still, it wasn't maybe a massive uplift. Whereas, you know, going, you know, Toulon was going to be a big lift up f for me. Well, not actually a big lift, but then if you take a few things that might have been possible around tax, you would have got a good uplift but I was like, at that point quite interested about what it would be lifestyle wise I don't know how it would have worked so I would have had to commute because Zara at that point had 15 horses right. <laughs> that's a it's a hefty side bill for them if they were going to try and help yeah. help her out maybe move down there but um yeah, I, I just the problem is they eat them over there as well. So you yeah. <laughs> so can offer to take them, yeah, yeah. and then you're like, "Why this uh, meat delicious. is lovely?" So oh, you want to look after them, <laughs> not eat them. I am so sorry. It did appeal to me. I went and saw Czech when he was at Racing. Stad, uh, Stad, yeah, Stad. Sorry about going there, um, but that never sort of came off. That would have been probably easier to commute. But um, what, what's really interesting about both of this, from a is, is hearing from the players yeah. who've been there and done it or not done it in your case is the the battles that players are going through on a contract basis is what you don't tend to read about very often ever. in the papers yeah. ever and, it's and, all and, about and it's like the wild west like i don't think you appreciate like the championship is even worse yeah yeah but the amount of players that i get to message me on when we've done this uh, when these done these shows about contracts you would not believe that some of the behavior around contracts in these premiership clubs by owners and by coaches and when i mean farcical and laughable and like you wouldn't believe the way that it's been negotiated and handled they might not be now obviously there's well, a, there's I mean, a even, even even involved, but, but you're well. still getting messages now i still get to yes people still talk to me and it's amazing around sort of only two years ago around the covid situation yeah. around how that oh, yeah, was that handled was well, yeah. we, we, you know we, we had someone we interviewed recently you know he, he's suing a club because they promised him something and then didn't and then just turned around and went no, we're not going to do it anymore. Yeah. And it's like you, and that is a, that is a very interesting factor, which goes into this argument, which you, you don't the, tend to read about in the sorry, papers. But, but then the French side, yeah. the other side of it is, you know, if you ask about um, Toulon, you know, allegedly boys still want money off the, that owner now, or yeah. the, the former owner, Bougelot. because because he just goes no and sue, sue me, yeah. And but you're tied up in French courts, the legal system, you don't get it. So again, the thing with the the, the, the French is it's fantastic. But it is as loose. Rugby generally is just not very well done across yes. the board. And so I think what you what will you you will gain with certain aspects, players have to be aware you're gonna lose and find out a completely different avenue you but hadn't taken into uh, account. Also why it comes a, a viable option for let's say people who are already established and everything else is you know, Samaj is is a very good tax law in 
which means you get your tax back. Well, you 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 get 85% of your salary for the next two years. So it gives you you a two-year window. Oh, oh, once you stop playing, yeah. It gives you a two-year window to try and figure out what you're going to do next, which we don't have. I tried to do it because I thought it was just, you you know, chômage or whatever it's called. You you did it, um, and you basically then... But I had to go to interviews. So you have to sit down with someone and like, almost like an employment thing. Are you looking yeah, for work? Are you, are you doing it? I never did it, so I never, I never got it. But like someone like Simon Shaw, some of these guys, it's yeah. too late, unfortunately. I missed yeah. that window. So what's very interesting having this debate with you is there's far greater sympathy for the players. Yes. There's greater security, potentially financial security. Yes. There's the opportunity to improve yourself by going abroad. There's new cultures, new teammates, etc. Can we just discuss some of the negatives? Yeah. Which the counter argument would be that if you take out Marrow, Owen, etc., etc. The league loses the stars. It loses the ability to put more bums on seats. The television revenue, therefore, becomes less appealing off the back of it. And if we're trying to get, and you've mentioned this already, if we're trying to get money back into the game, you've got to have the super. We talk every week about the need for superstars. If those superstars aren't playing in the Premiership, you've got a problem. Can I just ask? I will, I will come on to. I agree. Just one yeah. thing I, I want to. I'm interested by because the people who are, who are against this. I think it's all. It's always very good to give away money that you've never been offered, never have, and to always turn it down. That's why I'm always interested in the political landscape. People are always very keen to spread money that they never had, or they see other people with money and go, well, you, you give it to other people. It's very yeah. difficult when we've seen it in our own business lifestyles, the three of us together and people we've worked with. When you've got nothing, you're all very agreeable. Stand on me. Don't worry about it. Well, I'm very trusting. Give you 100 grand, and you have to give away 50% of that yeah. suddenly you're not that keen. That's why people win the lottery. I'll give everyone a million quid. And then you do it and they never give anyone anything because suddenly you've got something. It's the same thing with the people who say you shouldn't go or don't do this or, sh- or should be paid a, a certain amount of money. As a sports person, you have a very short period of time. We're very privileged about what we do. But because we are in the entertainment business, there is money that, that people want to pay us. It's very hard for you to turn around and go, look, be, stand on me, be faithful, be loyal, we'll look after you, take half the wages, <laughs> you don't want to go abroad, this will be absolutely fine. It's not your money yeah. or your career. It's not your money or, or your, your career. Ambition. And, and the yeah. first time you, the first time any pressure comes on, you're the first one out the door. You yeah. saw it exactly with COVID. I, obviously, I know that's a global pandemic, but that is a great example. It was like the Wild West. Money was taken off you and never handed back. Yeah. I, as, sport, as rugby players, you do not earn enough money. Well, this modern generation might, you know, if it's allegedly what... It's, it's still not earning enough to No, no, food. but like someone like Marrow's on 800 grand a year or so, allegedly, right? Yeah. You still get taxed off the arse off, the, off that, by the yeah. way, 50% tax rate now. Yeah. Um, you know, you still have to be smart with that and you'll still have to uh, keep working and earning. So it's very difficult to tell a young player that they're going to go and play on a bigger stage in a bigger audience earn more money to look after their family, to provide for their future in a game that can take away your, your mental health, can take away your, your physical health uh, for the game of performance. I don't understand that. And I think if you do, uh, I think players should be encouraged to do that because every older player that I've ever met, especially the ones who criticised me when I left, have all taken me into the corner of a room at some point in the last 10 years and gone, you're a dick. No. Punch you in the face. Yeah, took me to the corner and gone, do you know what? I never said this to you at the time. I really respect what you did. You sampled the life experience that I never had. And I think you see it all the all the time, unless you went to a club that won everything. Yep. All of them a bit wistful. And I and but, I think, yeah. But there are loads, there's so many other things to think about. There is so like, you know, for Hask, it was quite a simple because he was a single man and yeah. it, it was it was I can live by my rules. Yeah. For me, from my point of view, weighing it all up with how it then fits into family life and you know, potentially starting a, a young family and is it the right place? You know, obviously Zara's job made it probably never the right a, a viable option for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ev- dragging you down. Oh, uh, everyone's got that decision to make on top of it. So yes, the money's always got to be good enough, but then there's got to be the lifestyle part to go with it. Or it just doesn't make sense. The pit, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, and yeah. and, that, and uh, but I agree with that. You know, every player should be allowed to make his own choice up and do whatever. And to not feel question, the, the pitfalls around it are, yeah. exa- are exactly that. So the the first thing is. Um, you know, you're going to unfamiliar, uh, unfamiliar places, um, especially if you've got a family. So people, I, I don't think, like, I, I wonder what would happen now if I'd had Bodie and I and I, you know, I was with Chloe and we'd gone over. Luckily, she could work from anywhere, yep. so that would have been okay. Uh, having a you know a daughter in a different country, actually, French medical care is unbelievable in, because of, of the socialism and everything else. Like I was, n- they never once told me they didn't have enough money to s- scan me at MRIs or doctors. Everything was taken care of. The medical side was fantastic. I needed a prescription, doctors on it all the time. But again, there's, there's sort of horror stories you hear about that, the issues around that. I'd say trying to take a family abroad, schooling is, a, is, a, is an issue. And some clubs are fantastic and are on it and will take care of everything. Like in Japan, 
you know, to go over there, I had to, you have to get your own seal because everything's, instead of a signature, it's done with a seal. You have to get a seal. You have to, you know, bureaucracy is off the, off the chain. You have to go through all this process to get everything sorted out. And if you, uh, luckily with Rico, they were so on it. I had translators that went with me everywhere. Some clubs, not as good. Or if your agent is not as good and they just sign you up to somewhere that you don't know, you turn up and you, you're you completely, uh, you know, uh, six and seven. I, I want to talk about the commercial impact, though. Oh, okay, so I think you No, 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 no oh. absolutely right. And it's, again, it, I, th I think particularly for the two of you, you see it very much from the player's perspective, yeah. as you should, and as you would do. But the commercial impact of taking the top 10 hypothetical England players out of the premiership and putting them into the top 14 or whatever it might be, you lose the social media clicks, views, etc. of Owen scoring a try for Saracens as he did against Bristol at the weekend. You lose Marrow looking heroic in a yeah. Saris jersey. That therefore has an impact in potentially in the visibility of the sport on people's social media, therefore potentially leads to fewer ticket sales, which leads to lower television revenue, it, it becomes a bit self-perpetuating. Is that a thing, or are we talking nonsense? I just don't think... I, I, well, don't, I don't think that's a thing. So you think I the think, league I holds up regardless the, yeah. of losing the top ten I don't think players. it makes a difference. It's not growing yeah. at the moment, is it? Yeah. You've got, you've got clubs going bust. It's not... Well, it's certainly not going to help, though. But I don't I mean, think it's helpful anyway. is one club where it would make the most of that fact because you're taking a lot of players... You, you're potentially talking about a lot of players out yeah. of one team. Yeah. So, yeah, the uh, Saris fans, but the uh, rest around the league, you're not talking about a huge difference in what they're seeing. But right. I, think, I don't think... Uh, uh, what would be really and interesting... you never know. They could replace our uh, guys with... Be better replace, guys. Yeah, I mean, funny enough, a, the, the counter-argument to that is, is most of the stuff that you see online now is Andre Pollard at Leicester, yeah. or it's Finn Russell yeah. at Bath, or it's... You know, overseas yeah. players playing in, in but the I think, But I think it will always, re I keep using the word rebounds. It will all, like, it's not suddenly those players leave and everyone's like wandering around going, I don't know how we're going to do this. Yeah. You, there's there's other players that will come in. There will spots that will be available because there's always that that ability of of, tra of, of inter-trade between countries and clubs. I, I don't think the game's growing at the moment. I don't think, because it's not like a Messi going to Miami, into Miami and all the, you know, and how clever that deal was, you know, with Apple and all the other people that came into it because they couldn't afford it. He structured probably more money than he was ever going to get from the Saudi Arabian team in the smartest deal ever. We don't have anything like that. I don't think these players quite retain the same level of power. I don't think yeah. the TV rights, bear in mind they're spread over about four or five different companies, look at it and go, uh, you know, if my, you know, if, if Messi came here, we're going to pay millions. I don't think it works like that. I don't think we're talking, yeah. they're not going to suddenly dip it if Mauro Toji goes or Owen Farrell goes, because I don't think that's why they put money into it. I think they look at it and go, most big companies, the, the, the shop floor goes to football, yeah. the directors go to rugby. So the owners of most big companies have got a box of Twickenham or in, or in the benches. Most of their staff are going to football on the weekend. That's never going to change. Middle England and, and particularly likes um, rugby. And I think that's why foot, t people have TV rights because it gives exposure to people who buy Range Rovers, who buy barbers, who buy certain things, who have time, whatever the hell they do. That, <laughs> time time shit. Yeah, I don't know, I bet a middle class thing, fuck those. Cornetta, people who have Viennetta yeah. for dessert yeah, are, they're the ones to, to 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 watch the you know who watch rugby. Me, that's me, why they're selling it. will come out you like a spider monkey if you go after Vin. But, no, so I mean, but remember, after eight minutes, one of the of Vin, underrated. No, if you if you if you've made it in life and you thought you're the shit, pull out a Viennetta at the end of a dinner, <laughs> and people right. go fuck me, and then a box of after eights, and you're uh, unplayable. Frere right? Rocher, <laughs> Frere Rocher, matchmakers, right? You're oh. a softball. That's what I mean. So my point is that, a, that I think the audiences for rugby. Are targeted and and and, cons and big brands get involved in rugby because it's access to an audience. I don't think it's about player power. But, I don't think it's, it's about but, yeah, that. Yeah, but it's always what we talked isn't. about. It's always about the club as as all the power. So people go to watch the club. Yeah, they're a fan of the club. Like a lot of people who are diehard, passionate Gloucester, Bath fans, they don't really care about England. Yeah. yeah. That's so the it's the I club think, that they get care for. So I don't, don't have. The, I don't think people like, people these, because people always talk about how, trying to encourage uh, rugby to have superstars to follow. I don't. With all due respect to Mara Toji, I might be completely wrong, but he goes, I don't think people aren't going to come watch Saracens yeah. because they're, they're tribal for the club and TV money will not dip because they're getting into the footprint of rugby for other benefit because we don't have the stars. I might be completely wrong, but I just it's never been that game. L looking at those England players playing abroad at the moment, Rassi 92, Henry Arundel, Christian Wade, Juno Kapoku. We've got Jack Noll at La Rochelle. We've got Joel Kapoku at Lyon. We've got Harry Williams, Sam Simmons at Montpellier. Uh, Poe, Dan Robson and Joe Simmons. Perpignan, Ali Crossdale, Stade Francais, Zach Henry and Joe Marchant. Toulon, Kieran Brooks, Dave Ribbons, Toulouse Jack Willis, of course, and in Japan, Nathan Hughes, here's Francis, James Grayson and Freddie Burns. I'm not sure at this point you would say that that is an exodus, hugely detrimental no. to the future of the England team or whatever it might be. But obviously there is some good talent there for various reasons. 
particularly those who've left because their clubs have gone bust. But I think when you look at the, I'm not, I don't want to do the service because they're mates of mine. I just don't think those individuals have that much of a impact on the game. Okay. Maratoji is a second, for example, Maratoji okay. is a second row. Yes. Right. He's incredible, but but is he? Like, it's more it's visibility. Yeah, it's visibility. You can. We don't market people anyway. Okay, good, good properly. point. We don't okay. do it. Okay, so let's let's draw on. So, how, yeah, this how, is fundamental. Okay, okay, move on, move on. Yeah, move this on. Fun, <laughs> yeah. No, C to be fair, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, move on, move on. Calm this, down. Okay, um, fundamental. Unless you change the whole way that the game is played in this country, yeah. and you change, you do the full overhaul of everything yeah. to make it a more spectacular, less games, more interest, yeah. drive, trying to drive more crowds. It doesn't matter, right? Because it, uh, I, think, it anyway. I think people are uh, creatures of habit. They will go to their club and watch their club yeah. Yeah. come rain or shine, whoever's playing. Yeah. Is it detrimental to Steve Borthwick and his England plans to have players playing overseas right now? I know we're moving towards a global calendar, which hopefully will align the windows, which means that it's less of an issue. Well, that was a, sort of a pig flyover just then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Well, <laughs> a hen at some point in teeth. our lifetime, yeah. potentially. <laughs> yeah, in our Is lifetime. it a problem for Steve Borthwick to have England players playing overseas? Uh, uh, Is it good for him? Uh, I think Is it if, irrelevant? Well, I think if he was allowed to pick them, it would be great for him. Right, and I think it would be really beneficial. Do you think the, the top fourteen takes players to a higher level yes. than the Premiership currently does? Yes, one hundred percent. So it would be a good thing for you. Yes, one hundred percent. Does it change where are the, the best way play players where are, are conditioned? Where are the best players in the world playing at the moment? Top fourteen. Do, would it change conditioning, etc.? Do you come yeah, back yes. from France as fit and as no, athletic? No, no. So that, so that again, again, I can only talk about my, my time over there. And Benjamin Kayser always sort of rolls his eyes and t tells me that I was talking shit. Um, kills a breeze. He, he kills a breeze, but most people do that. Um, but I, but to be honest, you. Conditioning and extras and everything else was, was a bit of an afterthought it, when I was at Stamford say, You know, it was bizarre. You could do a training session, drop 30 balls, and you still win on the weekend. You could have an immaculate training session. They'd finish. Not one person would do extra kicking, passing, tackling, apart from the kickers. Yeah. So, again, you had to be self-reliant and disciplined. I think that could be a, the potential, um, a potential issue. But actually, the quality of the games and the intensity of the games and the physicality and just the general size of people and playing on the, 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 those big arenas and the fact you have to be disciplined and you're playing with some fantastic players will gen generally raise the standard. Will you be as fit as you want to be? I don't know. I, I had to do a lot of extra work to maintain that and I was I was a bit unusual in that respect, but I think the top 14 has gone on. You know, This was a long time ago. It has moved on. I think now the French team, are, are as good as they are, I think standards across the board will be will be way better. So I don't see that as a massive problem because if you're playing all the time, you're going to be fit. Yeah. You know, you say the day, day one of preseason, everyone does all this preseason training, and in the first game after ten minutes, you're still fucked and you're still questioning why you even did any of yeah. the running because you're still it's still awful. You might not as well have not done anything. Yeah, and I and I, th and I think the the French league has changed a fair bit because they work more closely with what Galtier and yeah. Sean Edwards and everyone are doing. So I think they, their standards will be driven but you know you're playing with it you learn the the place where you learn the most is when you're playing alongside or against the best in the world you learn in real time and you can't you can't replicate that anyway okay what I said, you know, like, well, forget, sorry i always forget juan leguiz and you know you, you guys met him on the, yeah. on the cruise ship what played man. with one i mean I, i'd never seen a bloke that would like could Box kick it or not box kick, do up and under himself and run and chase it, or just worked on it and just fly over the top of people. I'd never seen a back row yeah. player do that. And just the skills that both that the, the, they applied to the game. I learned more from hit watching him and playing with Sergio and those other guys than I did for, for, for ages. What you know, playing in UK. It's a complete aside, but I think it's interesting when you look at coaches who go abroad and the success that Stuart Lancaster and Andy Farrell and Graham Roundtree are having now. Rona Gara, well, yes, from from Ireland into France, but but there are lots of coaches who go overseas and come back better coaches. It's 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 a sort of comparison point, I suppose. So, well, well you look, you know, it's going to be interesting around Zach Mercer. He was well, yeah, so, so that's a that, that is a great example. Has Zach Mercer come back as a better player from being Montpellier Player of the Season? I haven't is seen. He, is, he hasn't obviously. He hasn't, oh, uh, he hasn't trans I mean, transferred injured, into an England. He? He's injured, so right. But his 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 um. You know, I, I, feel, I actually thought of him this morning when I uh, was in the shower. No, when I was, when I woke <laughs> up and I was reading the brief because I always read all the briefs, and I saw his name mentioned uh, and obviously being out about out injured. I did think he'd be gutted if he if you were him. Like I look at him as a career ch choice and go, I never would have come back. I don't know what he's on at Gloucester, but I know he wanted to come back for the World Cup. But he he was doing something like at, at Montpellier that the stats were like that the, he'd beaten like a. It's like 100 and, I, don't know, I don't want to say it's like 120 players and the next nearest person had beaten 96 or there was or I mean you know give or take but it was that dramatically better yeah and he was that he was carving up that many trees why the hell would you come back because he wants to play for England 
But I mean, I, I, whoever lured it back, it's so interesting so to look, know. There's, there's the thing is, <laughs> this is the fundamental of it. If you want to play for England, you have to make decisions. But it's yes. your decision to make and you live by it. Yeah. Right? Well, th but that's, uh, that's so the situation anyway, right? Yeah. Now. So, but, uh, you know, you look at someone like Marrow and, he's, and what he's facing in the future, he's got to make a decision that's best for him. You know, he's played, you know, is he potentially saying, look, well, I've played that many things. I could still play on the Lions next year. Even if I go to, to France, they could still take me and put it in their shoes. But ultimately, he's got to get it right for him. Zach's made the conscious decision. I imagine it'll be a good deal that he got off Gloucester, even though maybe not the same. Mm -hmm. But he's like, well, I want to come back. And he, and, he, and he hasn't got it. Now, does that mean that he'll go back next year or he'll go back whenever his contract comes back? Or he might do and just push it aside. From a business point of view as well, as a player, you have a choice to not to create a legacy that does too strong well, but to go and experience and introduce yourself on in different different countries. Because again, we're lulled in this country. We believe that rugby is, 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 is a be all and the end all. And you know, we're so entrenched and indoctrinated about, you know, team first, shouldn't leave. All the things that we're talking about now that we've, we're trying yeah. to sort of dissect and move away from. Going to play in France, I watched these Kiwi players going to play in Japan, you know, the likes of your Sunny Bills or your Mar Nonus, and just how it, it it built their brand across the board and how how much people wanted to know what these players were like and their yeah. teammates wanted to yeah. know what they were like. Same thing in France, same thing in, in um, New right. Zealand. You know, people did, they don't, in New Zealand, I, I, I went over there and the first thing I did was interviewed all the kind of my teammates to their sort of, you know, disgust and asked them what they thought English rugby was. And they, they all just went, I was smalling in it, just pick and go more. They didn't watch it. They didn't, they didn't get it on TV. They got Super 15 and they got their internationals. They didn't really get it unless they went to look for it. So their familiarity of what we were doing over here was just irrelevant. Suddenly as a player going to France, you're going to get to go and get a whole different um, a, a sort of spectrum of, of fan and person and, and, and sort of infamy, really. And I think, I think it's a completely different game in France. I, don't, I think England rugby, listening to what we've listened to through the Rugby World Cup and the people that I talk to, it's so structured over here. It's so stat-driven. And I think people go to France where it's a bit more play what you see and have a bit more freedom to offload. Do, and actually, it encourages you just to go, go out and play a little bit more. And I think it's probably more enjoyable. What do you think, though? Because you're absolutely keen. Like, do, do you see it as a bad thing or, or, an, or, or, or a good thing? What, England players going abroad? Yeah. Well, this, this is the bit that I think we should finish with, is, is what is the good, bad rugby recommendation? Because the administrators in England will say it's bad because it devalues the league, it reduces TV value, it reduces ticket sales, etc. Yeah. But from a player's perspective, what you're saying is it's the opportunity to go and test yourself against the best, try new things, get better, as about potentially earn more money as well. If we hypothetically say that at the moment we're at the bottom of the trough in terms of salary cap, it is yeah. starting to go up. If we say that they are working very hard behind the scenes to create a global calendar, if we say that potentially there is going to be opportunity to start bundling Premiership, Europe, Autumn Nation series, summer mm. tours into a package, and there is hypothetically a television channel yeah. of some sort coming. So we're starting to get the, the nuts and bolts of the season laid out. Is there a recommendation that both of you would make now around what it could look like for a percentage of England players to be able to go abroad? So if everything starts to come yeah. around and therefore, you know, the landscape is, is, is improved for England players within England, would you still build something that enables them to go yes. overseas? Yeah, so my, so my answer and what would is, it look like? So my answer, well, so I, I, I think firstly, um, I mean, I'm, I'm always a bit worried about this this cap, you know, the, the number of caps things because I don't, you know, they, they sort of do that as a feel good thing. Or you have 25 caps or yeah. 20, so that's 30 caps. That's the law of 30 yeah. caps. And I you mean, can go I, I can't remember how many I had when I went. It wasn't really relevant. I think the players should be able to go and do that. I don't think you should be frightened. Even of that. if there are hybrid contracts yeah, on I the just, table. I just think if you like. What were the, all the fear, all this fear, right? Maratoji was what, was he 18, 19 when he came out of Harrow and went straight into Saracens. We're not starved of talent. That I, I don't think because they're not they're not Ronaldo level players like yeah. that are so iconic, they're so at, like, unprecedented. That I reckon there's probably a load of people waiting in the wings. That if you well, you look at the way Exeter have regenerated yeah, yeah. pretty quickly. I, I was about to literally about to say the same thing. If you look at the Exeter team now, name you couldn't name no, most. Yeah, you could, I couldn't name. So there was always talent off the conveyor belt. There's waiting for an opportunity. I think that you should open it up so players can go and experience something because there are only benefits. And also the ones that make bad choices, there are only negatives waiting behind the door, but that is life. That is, you're meant to explore it, you're meant to, to experience it. Steve Borthwick would be in a better place as long as the contracts that you sign between the clubs allow them to come back and have, for the training camps yeah. and have access and the French clubs understand it and they go over there. And even if they had a hybrid contract where you would say to the French club, listen, we will pick up a, a part of the tab, whatever that amount might be, 
to allow us to have those backs. The French clubs don't feel like they're missing out or the Japanese clubs or whatever it is. So you would have open market yeah. regardless. You yeah. wouldn't put cap limits on it. No. You wouldn't say, you uh, just say, if you want to go, go. go. If you don't stay. Yeah, but bear, but bear in mind all the things we talked about because it isn't, it isn't as fun as you think it is at times. And yeah. it isn't There as aren't good. as many spaces. There aren't as many spaces. And it's actually um, dog eat dog. And if you are prepared to go and you are over in France, and even if you have access over here and you allow someone in the premiership, the premiership's playing better. You know, you're taking risks across the board. Yeah. So I think firstly, that's what should happen. I think, look, I always think that uh, the England team, having spoken to Eddie Jones and actually some of the stuff that came out, what Steve Borthwick said after this World Cup, was that when you get players back from the clubs, they are all at varying degrees of, of fitness, uh, game ready and, uh, and, and ready to play. Eddie Jones' biggest concern was he would get the players in a position to play to up to the standards of international rugby. He would hand them back to the clubs yeah. and they would come back in a completely different um, level of, of, of shape. I think that uh, RFU should, if it have the top players, should have some power. So there should be, you know, if you sign for Toulon, you should be allowed to play those. That's what the global fashion. calendar yeah. will hopefully fix. That should all be taken care of. And I think that the players, will, the UK uh, Premiership will reset. I don't think it's based on a stars. I think yeah. that's a fucking, you know, like a bit of a, a, a nonsense thing because there aren't, they are, they're stars, but they're not really driving the game. You know, if you walk down the street, talk and met someone around here, they go, could actually become bigger stars yeah. by going over yeah. there. Tell us, well, you, yeah. tell us your stars. Like, if you walked out of here, and tell us your biggest stars in English rugby. I don't think but, you know anyone. But but imagine Marrow coming back to play Bath in the European Cup in a Toulon show. Yeah. Then you get your, your yes. vir virality back yes. of social media content. I was just going to quickly throw in a very... Do you remember we did that Asahi event the night before oh, well, the that's, Rugby well, World Cup? A, yeah. We had Joe Roccafoca with us, one of the greats, yes. and coaching out Racing 92. He said to Tins, he said, I am so looking forward to working with Henry Arundel. What a player. Yeah. What potential. I, c I can't wait to kind yeah. of get to work on him. And you think about, I'd love to know how Henry's getting on in, in Racing. I mean, from the highlights we see, sort of Patrick on Debo yeah. and on you yeah. go. But you think about the fact, obviously, he was working with <coughs> Declan Kidney at London yeah. Irish, and now he's working with Rocco Thoka. There's yeah. a slightly sort of, you know, I'm being flippant, but there's a slightly different skill set. So you're saying open market. Absolutely. And I suppose if you look at the Premier League, you've got England's greatest goal scorer, Harry Kane, playing in Germany. Yeah. You've got Jude Bellingham playing yeah. at Real Madrid. The two, the, you know, the man right. and the coming man, are playing overseas right now. Are you open season? Are you anyone? play anywhere and we'll pick the team when the when the windows opens or yep. are you we need the stuff you are as well yep yeah i just said uh, we're not in a position where we can even argue the point do you see benefit in potentially getting let's say hypothetically they're earning half a million quid each the top 10 players off the books of the premiership five million quid goes overseas in terms of players paying their wages and therefore that lets the the league there's more talent in yeah. clears yeah. up space I think you get. I just. I don't. Look, see what, what is the URC? The URC is the breeding ground for the next generation of Irish players, Scottish, not necessarily Scottish players, but especially Ireland with how they function at the moment. Uh, you know, not Johnny Sexton for the last few years only had to play the maybe one game in the season, quarterfinal, semi-final, and the rest of the league is like growing their next generation. We spent the, our whole time trying to keep all our players here and then pay for the best players in the world to come and yeah. get get their money and stay in the top top the, shape that they've been yeah. why the, don't we just the let difference is there though is that their triangle looks like urc into european club rugby into england yeah. whereas the premiership it's it's sort of europe and the premiership are the same in fact europe's probably dropped below the premiership yeah. so it's now premiership into england yeah. which is a bigger jump you oh, would say i wouldn't well i'm not sure i agree with that last year i thought the cha the, uh, the champions cup last year was outstanding in terms of the level that was played yeah sure but england english clubs aren't aren't achieving very well, much at that level no they're not Saracens at, apart. They're not so. So you're saying that the other the other leagues are better. So why well, are your not best saying players that. I'm going saying to play in those I'm leagues? I'm saying specifically. I'm saying French clubs have got the squads to be able to compete on both. Irish provinces don't need to put as much effort into the URC, and so they can go harder at Europe. Yeah. The Premier it used to be Premiership into Europe into England. It now feels much more like Europe is a, an added bonus if you can. But we see English sides oh, as in what you can go after. Exactly, okay. the, the, the Premiership is is a much but harder week to week. That used to be how the top fourteen you know, did it. Yes, the, it winning was. the top fourteen yeah, was, was far more important. There were so yeah. two or three who so went if they hard. lost their first game. Yeah. They just won't put out a team exactly. for, the, for the rest of it. You know what the, 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 I mean, the, the but French rugby is better now yeah. as a result. The conclusion to what I think is if if all the old heads 
and the people in rugby think it's a good idea not to let players go abroad, Probably I'd go is. completely opposite <laughs> direction. Because right. rugby's never got anything right. If, if you look at the biggest global game, the biggest money turner in the world, and they are happy to do it, why football. Can, yeah, football, why can't rugby do it? You don't know what you're talking about. You don't just don't, stop being fearful because do you know what? We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. You might as well go with the one that other people have done and done it properly and expanded yeah. the game for all the reasons we said of stop thinking that you're that important and it's gonna the game's gonna fall apart. Right. It won't. So just yeah. stop doing it. Flip, oh, it around, I... flip it around. So if, if Marrow went to Paris and started playing there and then people were on a trip over and they were, they actually love Marrow, they'd be yeah. like, oh, I wonder where he used to play. We'll go watch yeah. Scarry's game. Uh, and what is if Marrow's out of the way and some young kid we never heard well, of comes through? you're Paris. You're going to spend the Saturday in Watford. <laughs> yeah. well, sh- they don't know that. They don't know that. They don't know <laughs> what Watford is. <laughs> she's a ma- no, oh, she's she's amazing place. place. not global uh, ambassador I, I for North London. I imagine he comes from a beautiful place. This is a Watford. I want to go to Watford. I wonder if there will be some amazing food there. Oh, my God. This place is fucking awful. They play on the crap. What is this? Astro tough crap. <laughs> yeah, it's 4G. It is yeah. awful. Good. No, I'm a really you now. sensible global conversation about the future of English rugby descends into a clue zone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. so I was just pissing by the window. <laughs> I'm telling you now, um, if rugby thinks it's a good idea and it's been done, do it the opposite way because you're not, you're not good at right in years. I, I, do, and I, I think the fear and the idea and the grandiose belief that we are going to fall apart because a few of the players a, I go. I thought you were going for a triple rhyme there. No. The fear and the the deer. The fear and the deer. I just yeah. think it, I just think it's I just don't think it's that bad an idea. And I think actually it's been done and proven in other sports. Just do it and worry about it later because the current situation, the game's and going and down actually the toilet. Now is the time to do it. Now is the time. If you said fear. right for the next three years, anyone play anywhere, yeah. and let's see what happens. Yeah. But if you want to play for the world. If the England in the 2027 World Cup, you have to be no, playing the season before back in it. Just it works in football. Don't just don't don't worry about it. It does. You don't need to. As long as you get it stipulated in your contract, you have to be back for training camps. And do you know what? The beauty of things, transport is, is you know, is so good these days. You can be anywhere in no time at all. It's not a problem. Don't put caveats to it. Just oh, let like them play and let them play. You can't have give a caveat. Give me a caveat. No, no, caveat. no you I like, like a cravat. Cravat. Like yeah, yeah, very good. Sorry. Very good. It's yeah. um, open market is the... Haskell doesn't know what to talk about. The game's going to fall apart. I lose all the stars. We have got... We've got two former players here we did extend the invitation to a, a couple of administrators for various reasons why would they it, now is not the time i know there's a lot going on backstage in terms of the machinations of what season structure and potential hybrid deals and they, rfu so it's, it's completely so, so i'm just saying the thing that, is, that we have had a very one-sided argument what the rfu think it is what well it's not irrelevant because they are going to be the ones that come to the party to, yeah, to offer contracts they're being to get selfish them. about themselves yeah Okay. All right. Do you know, yeah, they are thinking about the okay, the, let's keep the guy friendly. running the the, the rugby club. The uh, they aren't thinking about Alex Brown. Yeah. They aren't thinking about the owners of the Premiership Rugby. Well, I think I think actually nowadays they're trying to help uh, uh, the how? clubs <laughs> because I think moving forwards there's going to be a far greater collaboration between England Rugby RFU as it is and the Premiership. Not, there is a so much greater is willingness to work so together. They're going to pay. So they're going to pay that. T- they're going to get those twenty contracts. Yep. This, let's say, which is talked about before. Where where is the um, inclination for any of those clubs if they go right? We have control over your players. You can't play them this yeah. week. Well, this is the whole reason why. Uh, well, I'm sure there's a, there's a middle re- ground there. Isn't this there? Is, yeah. there's a, this is the whole reason why Central Contract didn't come in. And also, there's a battle now with all the EPS players. All right. all, you know, there's a and massive if, contract if issue. If you then take, it. Yeah, but if you then take the fact that the Premiership clubs have to have all uh, whatever we've got left, ten teams, to agree. So then you have to get all of them to agree. It's just... Yeah. And, and they'll never do it. Because they also, they've do. got a problem with the current EPS contract. Or someone we interviewed was telling us all about the issues there. They're having to, the problems. They're not, they don't believe in the people who negotiate it. When you always talk about rugby's working behind yeah. the scenes. I think behind the scenes, it's just one small <laughs> bloke having a tab on a sofa, going like that, going, I'm, I'm going to do something anytime now. But it's been 20 years. Anytime now, I'll fix it. They don't <laughs> do anything. Did, they don't change anything. Did you see that thing with Jason in the being explained the rules of rugby? Yes. Yeah. Which, which it, it's sort of a bit like that. it's just yeah. someone pressing buttons yeah. and yeah. making things happen. Yeah, because it just it, I, I don't understand like it takes well, it's taken the game we still haven't got heads around the concussion situation we still haven't changed contact rules in, in training we still can't get pl- uh, clubs to give players four weeks off without bullying them in after three weeks the EPS contract kit, people still aren't getting paid when they should get paid we still haven't got a global calendar we still don't promote teams properly we still haven't got full stadiums no one understands the fucking game we've now put a bunker in an extra it, it just stopped everything they think they know 
just go the other way. They can't even, people can't even activate sponsorship deals properly out of fear because everyone's risk averse. Just do the opposite. Look at football and go, how can we do it? How can we survive within the realms of our, of our structure and do it properly? And do you know what? It's going to blow up anyway. Might as yeah. well blow up in style. Might as well change the rules and get a game we want instead of this utter shambles that we have to deal with. All in. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All in the minibus to watch Marrow at Toulouse next season. Yeah. yeah. Good. Do, do, do. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad we've um, we've bounced Given that around. around. <laughs> it's a player's perspective on England players overseas, yes or no. It's a resounding yes. Open market. And don't worry too much about it. <laughs> yeah. Just before we go, a quick note from our friends at NordVPN who are offering good, bad rugby listeners an exclusive deal. Did you know that you can use NordVPN to protect your online card payments? This will help prevent your details from falling into the wrong hands while shopping online. Christmas shopping is around the corner. Have you got it done? Yes. Uh, well, Christmas shopping, I mean, I use NordVPN all the time. We actually right. use it a lot when we're on the on the cruise in France to watch yes. the rugby, to catch up with stuff. I use it all the time because I was bored of your chat and I had to watch some TV series. I found it very, very useful. Good. And actually... Um, You're like one of those toddlers. We just put the iPad in front of you and you use your NordVPN to quietly sit. I do. And watch your Use my current media storm as well. I'm, I'm, I'm Does it block all of that out? No, but it, it means I'm just pep, you know, pepping up my security so I'm just right. covered, you know, because no one wants to hack and see my search history because that'll... That will change the dynamic of the show. Have you done your Christmas shopping, Michael? Uh, yeah, pretty much finished. What does a man with everything buy? A man with everything. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Are we doing Secret Santas together this year? Yeah, we can. Great. Well, you know what you're getting. A little love and thought in that. <laughs> uh, as we said, you can get a discount on your plan, plus four extra months on top. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash goodbadrugby. The link is in the episode description box as well. Uh, any more for any more before we finish up? Anything exciting in the diary? No, I would like, if someone has listened to this, come back and, and challenge us and, and explain very clearly I'm sure they will. why, why come it in will hot. cost us the money and end the world and rugby will fall apart. Um, I would be interested to see because I'm always well, open minded. Say, open sofa for any administrator I, yeah. that would like to come on. I, I, I want to hear why, why I'm wrong. I want to yeah. hear. I'd, yeah, like yeah. To, I'd like to be challenged. Anyone uh, welcome. You know, I, I learn every day why I'm, I'm wrong. And by yes. the way, this is only our opinion as ex players. Yeah. yeah. With it'd years and years, years of experience and understanding what's actually going on. But yeah. Let, let's open open forum. If you're an administrator and you'd like to tell yeah. us why we've got it wrong, please come on. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what players say. If you're a fan, you can't come on because we don't really want you on here. But you can write in. And tell us why we're wrong. Not, not to me personally. Send us a video, send, yeah. we might play it. Send it to info at goodbadrugby.com. We'd love to hear about it. Um, don't insult us on social media because we'll just block you. But We'll use our NordVPN. We will. We'll you. VPN you. Uh, we're on tour still. The I might tour get a gun and call it my NordVPN. <laughs> <laughs> just VPNs on. It might not be up that. Uh, right, four more dates if you fancy coming to join Good Bad Rugby live. Plymouth, Newcastle, Nottingham, Manchester and Bath. We've got Jason Bath's Fox. sold out. We've, We've got, got Jason Fox, Fox Plymouth. Went on Plymouth. Yeah, that'd be good fun. And we've got Jero, haven't we? Oh, Jero, Jason Robinson's coming to Newcastle and Manchester. How good would that be, The Jack? ledge. I mean, he's unbelievable. You know, yeah. he's one of his, um, oh, this is the biggest first question I'm going to ask, one of his kids dated Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things. Right. Whilst playing rugby league for Bradford? Might be. I think but so. I'm not really interested in rugby league. He's, 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 he's youngest, son, his isn't His hairdo's off the Really? Chart. Right. Oh, my word. From Jason Robinson, that is it for this week's show. We've been the good, the bad, and the rugby in partnership with our very good friends at Continental Tires. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Click the subscribe button, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now.